I hope you're ready. We have another week of a book club. We're breaking down part three of Paris Hilton's new book, Paris, the Memoir. We're going to be talking about the sex tape, uh, the simple life, going to jail, getting heat from David Letterman and all the press, and basically the start of her stardom. So get ready. Let's dive in. Oh, hi. It's me, Zach Peter, pop culture junkie, reality TV insider, published author, and host of the No Filter with Zach Peter podcast. Here I'll bring you all the latest news on The Real Housewives, deep dives into celebrity legal scandals, and unfiltered combos with your favorite stars. I've got you covered. And yes, I always keep receipts. So be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for all the latest tea. Now, let's dive in. Happy Tuesday. Um, I've got a little carb-free wine going on. Hopefully you guys are enjoying yourself, imbibing whatever you are sipping on tonight. I hope you are enjoying it. Let me know, one, what your first name is and where you're watching in from. And two, if you are reading the book or you're just here for me to recap it for you. Because I'm here to do that. And I'm here to have fun. So we broke down parts one and two the last two weeks. Now we're into part three. Um, which is a lot of, uh, we get into a lot of her early fame days, right? The simple life, the sex tape, and kind of how that all catapulted. And it seems like it catapulted or like it really started to build immediately after she got out of Provo. That's when her fame started to really build. Tom and the extras are playing in June right now where I live in Michigan. OMG, ew. Who's down to go to a Tom and the Most Extra show? I may have an update that I'll give you guys on that very soon. Stephanie from South Philly. Stephanie, are you coming to our live show? I'm going to be in Philly April 27th with the Brav Bros. We're doing a no filter night out. We're going to be taping the podcast live, having a good time, doing some meet and greets. You can get your tickets at nofilterlive.com. That's nofilterlive.com. Come on out. Stephanie from South Philadelphia. I hope to see you there. Good evening from Chicago. Hi, Jen from Chicago. I'm here for the recap, not buying the book. Oh, okay. Fun girl. It's okay. We can have some fun. I'm making some katsu chicken curry. Oh, oh, okay. All right, so shall we dive into the book? I feel like there's so much going on in the world between the scandal of it all and the um, Paltrow trial, which I've been knee deep in, which has been a lot of fun, to be honest with you. And then I just found out James, Gwyneth Paltrow's hunky attorney, which we have Owens and Owens is just not the vibe, right? Like Owens is just such a pain in the neck. If anybody caught up with the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp trial, if you followed that closely, we had Elaine who was on Amber Heard's team, her legal team. And oh my God, Elaine was a pain in the neck. But now we have Owens and Owens is like, hold my beer. I'm about to be the most annoying celebrity trial attorney ever. So Owens ain't feeling it, but James is a cutie and James is like very good and he's great at cross-examination. And I just found out he's a performer. Um, he has like music on iTunes or an Apple. It's not called iTunes anymore. Sorry, I'm dating myself. Um, on Apple Music, he has music and it's like, oh, okay. When you called James Hunky, I thought I immediately thought of Hunky Dory. Oh my God, that's funny. Um, okay. Hello, what's going on, guys? Okay, let's dive into part three, chapter 14. Owens is painful AF. Spotify, he is painful AF. But yes, um, James is on Spotify and on Apple Music. So you can like type in James Egan and be like, oh, hi. Egan is hungry. He's a hunk of hunk of burning love. He's like Clark Kent. He's even with his glasses and his Invisalign, I'm just like, hi. And he's what, like 34. I thought he was like younger, but he's 34. He's older than me. Okay. So chapter 14 kicks off. Paris is now free from Provo. She talks about how much she identified with Brittany when she first came out. Cause at that time, Brittany had hit me, baby. One more time. My loneliness is killing me. And I, I must confess, I still believe, still believe. So she resonated with that because she's like, I do still believe and my loneliness is killing me and I just want to be free. And so she just said that she resonates with Britney. She has a lot of like positive nods to Britney. 
Um, but she said that people began questioning what happened to Paris during that time. They're like, oh, where did where was Paris these past couple of years when she was secretly at Provo? And Kathy was telling people that it's unfortunate because Paris had a stalker. And so they had to homeschool her in London to protect her. And so that's the story that they went with. And that's the story that Paris went with. And so for the longest time, she was like, I had a stalker and I had to go to London to get homeschooled so that I could be protected, even though I was really locked up in solitary confinement in some Provo boarding camp that my parents had me kidnapped in order to get thrown into. But she says that Nikki was her saving grace, that she followed her lead because Nikki just knew how to do life way better than she did. And she says that she was afraid of being back home, though, because the school had initially threatened that um, if she came out and spoke about them in any sort of negative light, that they would lie about her, that they would forge medical documents and talk to the press and leak all sorts of negative things about her that didn't even have to be true. She says that she ultimately wasn't made for school and she felt shy around the other kids. So the trauma that came from Provo only made it worse. Now she's 18 and she was ready to find her independence. Hit me, baby, one more time. She wore sunglasses as a shield from the world, but, you know, she was now ready to live it up for all the lost time that she had lost, I guess, at Provo. And so she would go out partying, but she'd party with her sunglasses. And that's why like, she's like, now if you see me wearing sunglasses, that's kind of my shield, which is interesting because Khloe Kardashian also talked about the shields um, and the sunglasses when she's like on red carpets and she likes to wear sunglasses because it kind of blocks her out. And it's so interesting because I also, not that I'm like Paris Hilton or like Khloe Kardashian famous or anything, but like I also have that that thing where it's like when I want to tune out the world, I just wear my sunglasses and sometimes I'll just like wear them in my apartment building and like in the elevators or like at the grocery store. Like I wear it as kind of like a shield because I also have like, I don't want to say I have social anxiety, but I do have moments where I get really uncomfortable and anxious in like social settings. And I remember even when we were on tour last year, I would have moments where I would like wear my glasses a lot, my sunglasses a lot. And I remember like telling people, like I remember a night um, we all went out, we were in Nashville and we went out with Emily D. Baker and um, her crew. And I remember telling them like, I have my sunglasses on tonight because I just like, it's my defense mechanism and it's like my protection. And she's like, I get it. She's like, I feel the same way. And I was like, or, like in terms of like wearing sunglasses, about like, you know, when you want to kind of block everything out. Um, and it's like a safety blanket. I wear my sunglasses at night. Yeah, see, some, it, some for some people, it makes it feel like if I can't, if you can't see my eyes, you can't see me. And so it kind of like is some sort, I wear my sunglasses all the time. See, people can relate. Paris also used to pretend to talk on the phone in clubs that no one would approach her. That's right, Val. She says that she still does that, that she pretends like if she's walking out of the airport, she pretends to be on the phone. That way it seems like, you know, there's a reason she's not engaging with the photographers. But she says that she still has debilitating trauma that she still has to deal with post-Provo. And she seems to connect to it a lot, but she found comfort in dogs and dogs and pets have always been her support system. So after Provo, she became more of a tabloid fixture and she loved the attention that she was getting. And she's just happy that she had her little pups to come home to. I'm excited because I just got a puppy um, that's coming home with me this weekend. And I'm really kind of nervous, but he's a little baby and he's a cutie. And so I'm like, okay, I guess I'm doing this dog thing, but listening to her talk about how like she has that support system and that support network and like the dogs kind of were her support, emotional support pets. Um, I mean, it was cute, right? So that after Provo, she really started to kind of become super famous. And that's when she realized her value in marketing. And she's like, I'm going to these events and people keep inviting me to events and giving me free product products. And, and now I need to learn how to make money off of this because paparazzi are making money off of my photos and people at events are making money off of every event that I attend. So it's time that she starts to charge and it's time that they start to put some money on her name. So she's a smart businesswoman, always has, has been. So uh, she says she really loves business. She knew that, you know, she was ready to turn herself into a brand. She says even to this day when she goes to the airport, she loves to stock up on business books, which I think is smart. I think she's a lot smarter than I think we realize, which also has me like raising some eyebrows and having some questions about this book and about some of the stories and retelling and 
stuff that she lays out in the books. I'm like, you're a very smart businesswoman. You're a very smart marketer. Is this possibly a PR strategy to help rehab your image? You know? Then we get into chapter 14 and she was getting paid to party now. She was signing with modeling agencies. She started, you know, looking into real estate and she was ready to just make that hundred million dollars that she envisioned in her head. She said that that was a clear number that she wanted to make because that felt like security to her. Then she talks about her experience with Harvey Weinstein at a charity event for AIDS. She says that he followed her into the women's bathroom and she tried to hide from him. And he kept telling her, like, do you want to be a star? Do you want to be a star? As he banged on the bathroom door to try and get her to let him in. But ultimately, security came and removed him. She said that she was always embarrassed to come forward with it before. And that's why she never said anything sooner. But now she feels comfortable, I guess, because other people have come out and talked about it. She feels more comfortable sharing her experience. She said that... um, she does empathize with the women that struggled and she wished she would have come out sooner. So there's that. But she also then gets into dating Rick Solomon, the bad boy that was on her radar at the time. You may know him as the guy that sold her sex tape. He was also recently married to Pamela Anderson. She talks about how much he wanted to film them having sex together. She thought that it was embarrassing to film something like that, and she didn't really want to, and she felt pressured to please him. But he was like, no, this is absolutely going to be private. He assured her that this was something just between the two of them, and if she didn't feel comfortable, she didn't have to do it. But if she didn't feel comfortable, he would just find another girl that would be willing to. And she says that she has like a um, codependency issues, like Raquel Levis claims to have. And that, you know, she wanted to please him. And so she kind of felt pressured to do it. But again, he assured her it would be private. She said that even though people see her as a sex symbol, she's definitely a lot more asexual. And she's completely closed off to sex unless it like mentally stimulates her first. And that's what she loves about Carter. She says that he's patient and he tries to understand her and he knows psychology and is very much empathetic toward her struggles with ADHD and with her past trauma and, you know, with all these other things that she's opening up about. She said that at the age of 19, she wanted to prove something to Rick and she wanted to prove something to herself. So she got drunk, she took some quaaludes and she went through with the tape. Okay, Zach, I travel with my dog. He hangs out in LA bars all the time. You got to get a doggy stroller. Okay, I'm not going to get a doggy stroller. That is not happening at all. He's also not a lap dog. I don't like lap dogs. Um, he's a, a, a Labradoodle. So a Labrador mixed with a poodle. So he'll be a good medium-sized pup. I don't like little dogs. <laughs> Sorry to anybody that has little dogs. I would never be Paris Hilton with like my little Tinkerbell. And I would never carry a fucking stroller. Like I'm just not that kind of bitch. Um... Not me. I'm not going to put little bow ties on him. Like, we'll see. He's going to pimp out some brand deals for us. We're going to open up. I'm going to Paris Hilton. I learned a lot from the book. I'm going to, we're we're now opening ourselves up to a whole new product category of brands that we can endorse. So he's definitely going to earn his way in my house. Okay. We're going to put him on modeling gigs. We're going to, you know, make sure we sign brand deals. So when I'm endorsing something, you know, he's going to be getting it good. Okay. Labradoodles are very smart. He'll need a laptop. Oh, okay. Should I get him his own laptop? You know what? He's going to be my cameraman. I'm going to make sure he has the lighting set up and he's going to have the whole show. That We're going to run this business. We're going to Paris Hilton our lives and we're going to run it like a business. Then, okay, then we get into chapter 15 and she talks about her modeling career and how that was now starting to develop and she had a strong appreciation for art and creativity. This chapter was a little boring to me. Um, she talks about working with Dave Chappelle and the iconic Vanity Fair photo shoot that they did. And then she talks about how that led to her interview with Nancy Nancy Jo Salas and Kathy, Kathy Hilton was originally not a big fan of all of this attention and press and she didn't love the Vanity Fair shoot, but... Paris didn't really mind it. Paris said that she was ready for stardom, but it seemed like Kathy was reluctant to allow Paris to kind of lean into that celebrity. Then we get into chapter 16, and this is where Graham Cracker died. And Graham Cracker, as we know, is Big Kathy, who we read a lot about in House of Hilton. So Kathy took it very hard, the loss of Big Kathy. Paris says that death scares her, and so it was strange for her to say goodbye to, to Graham Cracker, and it was interesting watching her mom so fragile at that time. But she says that her career ended up taking off. She was pitched on The Simple Life. It was originally supposed to be her and her sister, Nikki Hilton. But Nikki was like, ew, David, I want to stay classy. So Nikki Hilton turned it down, which then ultimately is how Nicole Richie came on board. 
Paris was supposed to be the ditz and Nicole was supposed to be the troublemaker. So they ended up filming it. It went really well. Then um, the show went into post-production. And she says that while they were getting ready to launch the show, she was working her butt off, taking every opportunity that came her way. And then Paris found out that she was pregnant with her boyfriend, Jason. And this immediately sent her into a spiral because she didn't think she was ready to become a mother. She didn't know what to do. She ultimately made the decision to have an abortion. She said that she had too many physical and emotional issues going on at the time that she just knew she wasn't in the right place to be a mother. She and Jason didn't last either. She said that he was great, and but it just wasn't working anymore. And ultimately, the uh, she had a storage locker that had a lot of her private documents in there and some of her medical records that somebody gained access to. And then they ended up publishing her medical records on the internet, on a blog that had a subscription like it was a, a subscription, it was like an OnlyFans, I guess, but like before OnlyFans and it was just like a blog. It wasn't like naughty, but she said that that's where it was revealed that she had an abortion because her medical records were published publicly and she was heartbroken by it because she's just like, it wasn't an easy decision for me. It wasn't a flippant decision. It was a decision that I wish I didn't have to make, but unfortunately it was the position that she was in and she just knew that she was not ready to be a mother. And so as challenging as it was, it was the decision that she ultimately chose to make. And then boom, the sex tape leaks. She immediately called Rick, begged him not to release it. But he said at the time, he's like, listen, it's too late. The tape's already out there and I have every right to sell something that belongs to me. I filmed it, it's my tape, I'm putting it out there. And so she was heartbroken by that. She knew that at that point, her life and her career were about to turn upside down. Everything that she had worked hard for, she thought was going to just get ruined at this point. She's like, I'm not even going to get to build this brand that I'm hoping to build. Hi, Sarah Bahu. Um, Kathy said that, you know, you just, you can't give this life. You have to, the tape was out there. Nobody would stop talking about it. It was all over the press. And Kathy's like, don't engage, don't engage, don't engage. If you don't give it life, it'll die down. If you don't address it, then eventually Lisa Rinna will go away. So she felt like she was back to ground zero and she didn't even think at that point that the simple life would even come to light anymore. She thought that the sex tape would definitely kill the simple life, that nobody would watch it or that the network would drop her. Ultimately, the network decided to move forward with the simple life. It premiered, it did exceedingly well. The tape was great press for the show. And so the producers eventually convinced Paris, okay, you gotta come out of the shadows, start facing the press, start doing some interviews. Like it's actually good for us. So I know this is challenging for you, but we have to lean into it and make the best of a bad situation. So she said that she's very grateful to Jimmy Fallon because Jimmy Fallon's the one that gave her her first opportunity out, which was a comedy skit that they did together. Um, the sex tape was called A Night in Paris. So I, they did like a comedy skit that was a joke about staying at the Paris, uh, the Paris Hilton. Because he's like, oh, so I guess there is a Paris Hilton. And she's like, there is a Paris Hilton. And he's like, is it good? Is it a? Is it nice to stay at the Paris Hilton? And she's like, the ratings are great. And he's like, well, I may have to enter the back door. And she's like, nobody's allowed to enter the back door of the Paris Hilton. So it was funny and she was very grateful because he was like, she's like, he was kind, he was respectful. It was comedy gold. Like he respected my boundaries and was willing to, you know, play ball with me. She's clear that she did not release the sex tape herself though. She said that had she been given the choice, she may have released it as long as she had control over it and as long as she owned it and was able to monetize it herself. But she's like, the fact that I didn't have that choice and that choice was taken away from me and made for me, she said that's what hurt her the most. She said that this is what inspired her selfie movement because it was her way of owning the photos that she put out there on her own terms. So again, this is where I get a little skeptical because I'm like, it seems like all of this is a very convenient narrative that we're all kind of lining along. Like, I don't know if the selfie was as strategic as she's making it out to be in the book or she's just trying to lay down this groundwork and foundation that she is this marketing genius. I think she's a smart marketer, but I mean, did who really thought that the, a selfie was going to become a movement and that this was her way of owning her images? And I think she was just like maybe a little vain, maybe a little narcissistic, wanted to take some photos of herself because it felt cute. And I think at that age, I don't think she thought that much of it. And then it became a big thing. And now she's just trying to position herself as maybe a little 
a little more strategic about it. Because here's the reality. Most people in business are not as smart and strategic. They're a lot luckier because they're a lot more resilient. They're tenacious. You keep going and going and going and going and going until eventually you strike gold. And then you just keep going and going and going and going until you strike gold again. Fake it till you make it. That's the nature of the beast of business. Not many businessmen are that smart. They're just more resilient. Okay, then we get into chapter 17. The simple life has taken off. Paris decides to trademark, that's hot, because that's hot. And it was like growing, right? So she knew from a very young age, she wanted to be famous. She wanted to become an icon and she was going to learn how to monetize that. And I'm just like, same. I want to be an icon. I'm going to monetize that. I'm an, I'm an international lifestyle brand. She says that the more famous she became, Hugh Hefner started knocking on her door and he started begging her to do Playboy, even offered her, offered her a seven figure paycheck, but Kathy would not allow it. She's like, no, I don't want people thinking my daughter's a slut. She already did the sex tape. Like I'm not about to lean into this now. And then one day to both of their su surprise, they saw Paris Hilton on the cover of Playboy. And she was listed as their star of the year. And so technically, because they named her as the star of the year, it fell into the category of news rather than a pictorial. So it allowed them to run a photo of her that they purchased, even though it was run without her permission, the same way Us Weekly or any other tabloid magazine can run these photos. If you buy these photos, you then have the rights to be able to republish these photos. And that's what was happening here. So even though they didn't have Paris's permission to put her on the cover of Playboy, they still did it. They still ran it. And she said, she says that it was an old photo shoot that she did way back in the day that was not like super sexy, but like she had fishnets on. And so it was like a kind of sexy photo shoot, but it wasn't a recent shoot and it wasn't anything she ever thought would come to life. So she says that she knows that it sold well because a lot of people went and bought the magazine expecting to see her naked inside, even though there were no actual nude photos of her to share. She said that she and her parents cried over it, but they just had to let it be and move on and not give it oxygen, not give it life. She says that she made a lot of mistakes at this point in her life, made a lot of, of mistakes in her 20s, things that she wishes she could take back. She gets into a lot of those mistakes, says that she's owning them now, and she's trying to never make those same mistakes again. Part of me wants to believe that this is a true act of contrition, but another part of me also believes that maybe this is just like a whole PR stunt in order to rehab her image because we know she never wanted to write a book before and now it sounds like a great time. She talks about how in an interview she like said that she was voting for Donald Trump and she's like, I never voted for Donald Trump. I didn't even vote that year. I would never vote for Donald Trump. And she talks about how, you know, there were many nights coming out of nightclubs and bars where she used derogatory terms that she wishes she never used. And so there's a lot of that, you know, there's a lot of that kind of, you know, let me apologize for all of these things that I've never addressed before. And there's also the very convenient narrative that like my mom told me not to give life to anything. So it's a great story and it's a great narrative. But when things are this, you know, when the, the bow tie is a little too pretty, it makes me question it. And again, she's a market, she's a businesswoman and she's a marketing genius. But I also feel like this book may be a bit of a PR stunt. Doesn't mean I don't want to give her a little bit of grace because she does ask for grace here. People can grow. I want to believe that she's grown as a person. So I'm choosing to believe that she's trying to be better, and especially now that she's a wife and she's a mom. So she's asking for grace, but I'll give her a little bit of grace, but no Frankie. Okay. A little bit of grace, no Frankie. Then we get into chapter 18, with, which is the final chapter of the night. She opens up about her st her song, Stars Are Blind, which was a mega hit. Even all the stars are crazy. Even all the stars are blind. If you show me real love, baby, I'll show you mine. You can make it nice and naughty. Da -na 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 -na. So that she's really proud of it. She's, it was you know, one of her proudest accomplishments. And listen, it's a bop, right? She don't even need to release any more music. Like that song was it. I still love that jam. Like Kim Kardashian song, remember? They play in my jam. They play in my jam. They play in my jam, 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 jam. They play in my jam. They play in my jam. Yes, yeah, Sarah, I get what you're saying. I would hate using my pictures and making money off of me without my consent. Yes, I do get that. But I'm also just kind of like, well, in Hugh Hefner's eyes, not that he was right, because he was absolutely wrong to do that. And he also did that to Marilyn Monroe, which we learned for the first Playboy image, for the first Playboy cover, sorry. 
that he did take a photo that she had posed for before and he ended up using that to launch it as if Marilyn had posed for the magazine, even though she didn't actually do that. Um, I do agree, but at the same time, like I get what, where he was like, listen, I was willing to offer her a seven figure deal. She said no. So I'm going to get what I want regardless, which is a bummer. Per, um, Hillary Duff originally sampled stars are blind and supposedly Paris's camp released her version of it before Hillary's team did. <gasps> what? That is not what it seems like in the book. She makes it seem like this was like the song that they were supposed to do that her and this artist were doing together. And like, it was, that is some juicy scoop, Mallory. I had no clue. And that is not the impression that Paris gives us in the book at all. At all. So she said that she's extremely proud of this song that she accomplished, even though it sounds like maybe it was originally Hillary Duff's. But then she gets into the DUI that she got. And she says that people wanted a big addiction story, but she's just not an alcoholic. She says that she was barely even buzzed. It was just wrong time. But she's also like, but I understand that like, I deserve it because it was a stupid choice that I made. And, you know, but the courts really wanted to make an example out of me. Ultimately, her license ended up getting suspended because she broke the terms of her probation, which then led to her facing jail time. And I listen, I think she was just young and dumb and didn't know any better, right? She makes it seem like, oh, I should have known better and all of this. Like, she judges herself harshly, which, again, feels a little bit like we're crapped in a narrative, feels a little PR stunty. Um, but the judge ended up sending her to jail for 45 days, which seems a bit excessive for a DUI. So definitely, I agree. I think they were trying to make an example out of her. Faux show. She said that she knew what she signed up for when she became, when she decided she wanted to become famous, that she knew fame came with challenges. It wasn't going to be easy. It was going to come with a lot of judgment and not a whole lot of slack. So to avoid the press, when she had to turn herself in, her team advised her to attend the MTV awards. I think, I don't remember if it was the movie awards. It was one of the MTV award shows. And they advised her to, to go to the award show and then turn herself in immediately after the award show. That way, everybody would be focused on the after parties and nobody would su suspect that she was going to jail that night. She reflects on how awful people were to her at that time, specifically like Sarah Silverman at the MTV Awards, David Letterman. She's grateful with how much she's grown, how, how much the culture has grown. Sorry. She's grateful that we have all culturally and the media have grown a lot. Even though her mother told her not to give things oxygen, she says that sometimes if you don't give things oxygen, you eventually learn how to cut off your own oxygen, which can kill you. So it's very reflective. She's definitely a tough cookie. She's a very smart businesswoman. She's a brilliant marketer. So who knows how much of this is genuine and how much of this is a marketing ploy to rebrand her image. But because if you think about it, like now she's at the age where she's in her 40s and she has to really build this mom and wife image so she can't really be this party girl anymore so it's like i have to make peace with my past show everybody that i've grown i've evolved and i'm in a better place now so that now she can start marketing baby stuff and mommy stuff and wifey stuff and so i think that may be the direction she takes her brand in. but in order to do that we have to tell her story right and we have to wrap it up in a nice little bow and show how smart she is so i don't think we'll ever know the real paris hilton but this is the Paris that we have. So this is the only Paris that we can go off of. Very curious what your thoughts are. Didn't she only spend 45 minutes in jail? I, I think she spent more than 45 minutes. There was one of them. I know Lindsay and Nicole and Paris. I know they all went to jail. Um, I believe one of them did only spend 45 minutes in jail. Was it Chloe? Chloe also went to jail for a DUI. But I remember there was a lot of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gobble me, swallow me, drip down the side of me, quick jump out, feel it again inside of me. Tell me, tell him what to put it, never tell him what I'm about to be. Talk your shit, bite your lip, ask for a car where you ride that dick. You really ain't never got a fucking fourth thing. He already made his mind up before he came. Guys, look at, I have my Team Ariana shirt. Who else got their Team Ariana shirts? Team Ariana. They're still available now in the merch shop if anybody wants to get a Team Ariana shirt. Minivan majority, motherhood, the ultimate whitewash terms. I love Lainey Gossip. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, it always seems like H was in her own lane. Hillary instead, interesting, there was beef. Maybe she was judging the bad girls then too. I think Hillary was smart enough to not get involved in the bad girl crowd. Or at least not get caught. 
I hope she's grown, but I imagine with how business minded she is, there's a fair amount of spin. I wish her the best. I've judged her harshly before, but I'm more mellow in my old age. I agree with you, Sarah. I don't judge her as much as I did back then. But again, it's like, how can we like, yes, there needs to be some personal accountability on us. But we also like, that's where our culture was. That's what the media was directing us to do. Not that that was right. But like, we were so consumed in this Perez Hilton culture that like, we didn't know any better. Now we know better. Now we're changing. So I want to believe and hope that Paris has changed as well. But only time will tell, right? Only time will tell. Wild times, early 2000s were unmatched, truly unmatched, truly incredible, incredible. Um, we will be breaking down the final part of the book next week, chapter, or sorry, part four. So the final few chapters in part four, we'll recap those next Tuesday, and then we'll get back to the Tory Spelling book, because I think that one was really interesting. I'm glad we got to kick that off. Also, I'm going to start this Sunday. We're doing our Vanderpump Rules rewatch party. So if you guys want to join us, I'll actually give you the schedule right now. That way you guys are fully prepped, briefed, and ready for it. Hold on, let me pull it up. That way you guys know exactly what we're doing, when we're doing it, how we're doing it, all of it. So week one, which will be this Sunday. So this Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific, we're going to be live streaming for members only. So you do need to be a member of the Zach Pack. The link is in the description below. You can join now. It's only $2.99 a month. Um, but so for the month of April, we're going to be doing a Vanderpump Rules catch up, or I like to call it a watch party rewatch party. So we're going to be recapping. So you have all of this week to catch up chap or sorry, not chapter. This is book club um, season two. So we're skipping over season one. We're jumping right into season two and we're going to be recapping episode four rumors, episode six, Lisa's angels, episode 12 till death do us part episode 14. I lied and episode 15, the reunion part one. So there are five episodes, which you can binge like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There you go. You can start tonight. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Episode 4, 6, 12, 14, 15. I'll post this on Instagram because that's a lot to remember. But anyway, it's all of the Tom and Kristen and Ariana and Jax and Stassi cheating drama. So we're going to watch all of those episodes and then dissect it. And I have Jeff Epstein. You guys know my friend Jeff Epstein. He hosts the Manic Podcast. He's been here a few times. And then Evan Real from Page Six is also going to be joining. So it'll be me, Evan, and Jeff. The three of us this week will be recapping those five episodes of season two. And then the following Sunday, we're going to be doing the Miami Girl drama. So we'll be watching uh, season three, episode one and episode 13. So season three, episode one and episode 13, Instafight and Miami Vices. And I'm going to be breaking that down with my friend Jess Rothschild from Hot Takes and Deep Dives and Tom Hamlet from the Dumpster Dive podcast. So the three of us will be recapping season three. And then after that, we'll be doing season five, Thirsty Girls and Pride, which is episode four and six. And then the week after that, we'll be doing season six and nine which is uh, episode six, episode four, and episode 16. And then we'll we'll wrap it up. Uh, we'll wrap it up by talking about the more recent season 10 stuff. So I will post that so you don't have to remember all of that, but it is for members only. So if you do want to become a member of the Zach Pack, you can join. The link is in the description below. Like I said, it's only $2.99 a month. So it's going to be fun. Lots of fun guests that will be coming on to help recap with me. So if you want to join join the Zach pack, become a member today here on YouTube and join our Sunday morning live streams. It's going to be fun. It's expensive to be me. Eh, eh, eh. That's just what I be. It's expensive to be me. Looking forward to this weekend. Rewatch should be fun. Yes. And you have just enough time to catch up on all the old ones. Oh my God. Yes. We need a Vanderpump rewatch. And my friends watched. I've never been able to discuss with people. Well, now we're going to be able to discuss it and we're going to reflect on it. So get ready, Freddie. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Like the video. Do all the YouTube things as Emily D. Baker. Do all the YouTube things. Like, subscribe, follow. You can always follow me at Just Plain Zach all over the internet. I'm like, 
my personal Instagram is just under 10,000. So if you're not following me on my personal Instagram, you can follow like me and my doggy and all of like our adventures together and me doing crazy drunk rants and me talking about my neighbors across the street and all that fun stuff at just plain Zach on Instagram. Or you can follow at no filter with Zach, which is our podcast account, which is just under 50,000. Um, so if you're not following that, go to at no filter with Zach and follow there for all the latest reality TV. Tea. Maybe I'll do a live tonight since I have some wine in me and I have a little time. Well, I have to catch up on the Paltrow trial, but maybe I'll do like a 30 minute live on Instagram tonight. Yay. Excited for the puppers. Can't wait to hear a name. You'll meet him very soon. You'll meet him soon. So get ready for that. Um, yeah. Follow me at just plain Zach, follow the podcast at no filter with Zach and stay tuned. Cause we're going to start our Vanderpump watch party this weekend. Get your team Ariana shirts at just plain Zach.com in our merch shop. And then get your tickets to see us in Philly. We're like, we're selling out Philly fast. I think as of right now, we're over 50% of the venue sold out. Um, and we're like almost sold out of VIP packages. So if you're coming to Philly and you need a VIP ticket, like I would suggest you get it like today um, because they're probably going to be gone like tomorrow. So go to nofilterlive.com. That's nofilterlive.com. April 27th, I'm going to be in Philly with the Brav Bros and we're going to be doing a live taping. No Team Raquel shirts, LOL Kitty. It's funny. People have asked me for Team Raquel shirts, Team Rachel shirts. I mean, maybe I'll, I will. Listen, I'm like Paris Hilton. I'm going to be a smart marketer. I'll do, t if people want to be Team Rachel, then I will let them be Team Rachel. Okay? I don't care. I'll take your money. It's not that deep to me. Okay. Love your lives so much, both Instagram and YouTube. Thank you, my love. We'll be live again on Thursday on both Instagram and the YouTube. So I'm actually thinking I'll, I'll go live on Instagram right now. All right. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Uh, stay tuned because I um, will go live on Instagram shortly. But thank you for joining tonight's live. Please hit the like button on your way out. If you're not subscribed, definitely hit that subscribe button. And hit the bell button. That way you always get the T in your notifications. Okay. Actually, if you are a member on the, of the Zach Pack, I'm going to drop um, some very special... Well, actually, maybe, well, no, yeah, some very special guests that are coming on in April that I'm not going to reveal publicly until it's time to release those interviews. But if you're a member of the Zach Pack, I'm going to post right now and let you ask questions of my very special guests that I'm taping with next week. All right. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.